can you hear it? The hustle and bustle of a busy city teeming with life. People coming from everywhere. Entrepreneurs and school teachers, government officials and sports stars, artists and media houses, all joining in to drive the powerful pulsating culture that moves a nation. This is the landscape of a city. And this is where we start our journey. Armed with faith to reach the lost, a love that can heal the pain, and a living hope ready to restore the brokenness of cities around the globe. Doxadeo is a family on mission, ready to see the earth filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. of Sunday school and I also work in women's and once a day I see a post on Facebook of uh, Doxa New Church and uh, then I got an email then I start a search and uh, I'm joined a course this course is very beautiful for me I learn about uh, this too much world of God and then apply on my life and Doxa New Church team is so good. Thank you. Hey Church, welcome home. And what a joy it is to be with you again today. You know, we, we always use that little phrase, welcome home, when we start off a celebration. But it's not just some senseless, you know, recurring mantra that we say. We really do mean it. Um, we have live chat hosts that are available right now to chat with you. Um, and you know, every time we see somebody typing into the chat function or we see your name coming up on the screen, uh, it's a joy. We recognize God is at work and we recognize this online faith community wants to welcome you home. So I've set my expectation high for today's celebration. My expectation of, is of God's word to deeply touch and transform our lives and God's spirit. To, to make us so aware of the presence of Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit in our lives right there where you are, whether you're in bed with your mobile device or whether you're sitting in the couch or whether you're taking a lunch break or whether you're in the kitchen enjoying a cup of coffee. Um, our heart, our desire is, is that you would experience the Word, the transforming power of the Word and God's Spirit wherever you are. As I mentioned earlier, we have chat hosts that are available to chat with you. Please do just type into the box and say hi or perhaps where you're logging in from. And then do remember, they're also taking live prayer requests. So as you join today's celebration, you can ask for prayer. And we've seen some incredible answer to prayer because we believe that God answers our prayers. Um, if you're watching this offline, perhaps on YouTube, you won't be able to ask for a live prayer request, but you can still email us at prayer at uh, We really do read each and every one of those emails. We pray over each and every one of those emails, and we would love to connect with you in that way. Um, now, today's message um, is the second of a series we've started called Follow. You know, whatever you believe about yourself, your world, about God, it counts for little until that belief is turned into a habit of action that eventually becomes a habit of the heart. Now we can all recall moments of revelation or insight or inspiration where we suddenly understood something about what life is about or what greatness is about or what we are about or how we would want to live even. But a day, a week, or at most a year later, the inspiration will fade and become just a distant memory. And we are left, as we were before, unchanged. Now that is what this series addresses. Creating habits of action that become habits of the heart. To follow Jesus, you know. And today we want to speak about the habit of faith community. Uh, we all have friends, we all have a community, 
but this is about a community that challenges you to grow into spiritual maturity. And so Joe's going to be ministering today in the Word about this habit. But before we go into the Word, let's celebrate our inclusion into the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ um, as we worship together. God of grace, you've given me your plans of hope and I believe that I am healed, I've been set free, with Christ I stand in victory. In every season you are here, you conquer doubts, you cast out fears, and at the cross my life arose I reign in Jesus Christ the Lord It is done It is done The finished work Of Christ the Son It is done I'm complete With Christ I stand
Hi there, and welcome back to the second session of Follow, as we explore what it means to take daily steps with Jesus. As disciples, we do not simply want to know about Jesus, we want to follow Him with everything that we are, with every facet of our life. And so these six life-giving habits that we are considering, they work to establish us in the new life that only Jesus can give. And in the second session, we want to look at our second habit. I belong in my church family. Now, John Oldberg tells of the author Susie Becker. She writes the All Better book that asks young kids to try and find solutions for big issues facing our world. So on how bosses could make the workplace more pleasant, Yesenio, age nine, says, give people a five-hour break. That sounds ideal in my mind. On what to do with lawbreakers, seven-year-old Lily says, make them do gymnastics for a month. Isn't that brilliant? Saw hamstrings, sorts out crime. But the toughest problem of all, they say this, with billions of people in the world, someone should be able to figure out a system where no one is lonely. What do you think, they ask. And the kids come up with some really interesting answers. They say, find lonely people, ask their names and addresses, then ask people who aren't lonely their names and addresses, and when you have an even amount of each, assign lonely and not lonely people together in the newspaper. There you go. Could it be more difficult than that? Or this one child says, make food that talks to you when you eat. So for instance, it would say, how are you doing? Or what happened to you today? Now that's frightening. I hope a sandwich never asks me how I'm doing before I eat it. But these are some of the things that they came up with. And you know, we laugh about it, but the reality is that loneliness is one of the greatest challenges facing our world. In the U.S., the former Surgeon General wrote in the Harvard Business Review recently an article titled Work and the Loneliness Epidemic, where he said that in his work, the greatest pathology that he saw as a doctor wasn't cancer or diabetes, it was loneliness. He said it's worse for your health than smoking 15 cigarettes a day and it crushes the soul. In 2018, in the UK, the Prime Minister appointed a Minister of Loneliness to try and tackle these detrimental issues that come with this loneliness epidemic. And research has shown that Gen Z and the Millennials, some of the youngest generations on record, they take up spots one and two for the loneliest generation. So the most technologically connected people on earth are also the loneliest. To this question, with billions of people on the earth, someone has had to come up with a system by this time that no one would be lonely. And I want to say that someone did. And it's called the Church of Jesus. But of course, when I say that, many of you would roll your eyes and say, the church? Because you have a picture in your mind of what the church is is all about. But I want to show you that the church is so much more than most of us realize. You see, from the very beginning, we see that the early followers of Jesus, they committed themselves to interpersonal and connected relationship. In the book of Acts that tells the early story of the church, we see that 3,000 people respond to the message of Jesus. And look at how natural the next step is. Acts 2 verse 42 says, All the believers, those who responded to the good news of Jesus, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to pray. This is what Jesus taught in Matthew 16, verse 18, when he said, Upon this rock I will build my church. So let me ask you, what's your picture of the church? What comes to mind when I say the word church? And maybe just for a moment, consider the picture that the Bible sketches. Because first up, the Bible says when it comes to the church, we should see it as a family. And that's maybe surprising to many of you. You think the church is an institution, it's a building, but the Bible says 
It's a family. Ephesians 2.19 says, you are members of God's family. The message of the Bible unashamedly is that God is our Father and we are His children. And so the global church is this global family, this global house with all these different rooms. And, and though we might have different preferences and styles and how we gather and how we worship, how we execute the mission of Jesus, we are united as one great family. In fact, the Christian philosopher Dallas Willard put it like this. He said, God's aim in human history is the creation of an all-inclusive community of loving persons with himself included as its primary sustainer and most glorious inhabitant, a family. But the second picture the Bible gives is of that of a body with many parts. Listen to what it says in Romans 12 verse 4. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. And so in this body that we have been put into, we've been grafted into, we all have our unique placing. We all have our unique gifting. No one is greater than the other. In fact, no, we complement each each other. We serve and love each other as a complement to the head, which is Jesus. And we follow His direction and mission. And so it's clear that each and every single one of us, if you are a Jesus follower, I need to commit myself to a church. I need to commit myself to a body. But maybe you ask, well, what does this look like? What does healthy church life look like? Let me show you three things from the Word. The first one is that a healthy church will cultivate a love for the Word of God in you. We call this in Doxodeo, knowing God. We see that the very first group of Jesus followers, the apostles as they were called, they committed themselves to the teaching of Jesus. And then the first followers of Jesus, the disciples, they committed themselves to the teaching of the apostles. The apostles were simply those early men who followed Christ and he appointed them to this role. They brought eyewitness testimony to the life and teaching of Jesus to the early church. And so similarly, our response, like the early church, should be to commit ourselves to a weekly gathering of the church where we can hear and take in. We can, we can wrestle with the word being preached and taught. Of course, the responsibility for growing in the word of God is always squarely on our own shoulders as followers of Jesus. James 1 verse 21 says, Humbly accept the word of God that he has planted in your hearts. For it has power to save your souls. And yet, that's why I know that simply once a week, one sermon a week, one teaching a week is never enough for a passionate Jesus follower. Simply hearing or simply reading is not enough. We need to cultivate. We need to wrestle. We need to take it and meditate and apply the living word of God. Once a week is not enough. For a passionate Jesus follower, so we, we read books, we go to Bible studies, we read daily and we wrestle with the Word. And of course, if you haven't gathered yet, being a follower of Jesus means that you are a student of Jesus. And therefore, one of the best ways to internalize this Word of God is to find others that you can teach about Jesus. The Great Commission in Matthew 28 has no height restriction. It's for all Jesus' followers when it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. One of the first great teachers of the word in the early church, the Apostle Paul, he puts it like this in Colossians 1.28. He says, so we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom 
that God has given us. We want to present them to God, perfect in their relationship to Christ. And that's why I work and struggle so hard, depending on Christ's mighty power that works within me. Dr. Dio has actually prepared a resource for you if you want to start walking the road with younger Christians. So go to firststepswithjesus.com and start this journey of teaching others the Word of God. But the second thing is that a healthy church will establish platforms for quality fellowship. In Dr. Dio, we call this loving people. See, every human being has a deep desire for belonging, to share life with like-minded people, to have support, to have those around them that would encourage and strengthen them. And the Bible says this is found without limit in the church of Jesus. When we look at the life of Jesus himself, this is how he lived. He had the three, Peter, James, and John around him. They were his closest confidants. But he also had the 12 disciples that followed him. And we see as his relationships developed, eventually he had 72 people that he could send out on mission for his kingdom. And we see the same pattern in the early church. They regularly gathered both in the temple and in homes. Just consider Acts 2.42 once again. It says they worshiped together at the temple each day and they met in homes for the Lord's Supper and they shared their meals with great joy and generosity. So it's clear that we have to devote ourselves to this kind of life-giving community. Living in community with a smaller group of people is where we discover who God is and what His plan for our life is, how we can bring hope and faith and love to our city. And I just want to be honest, it's impossible to engage people on that personal of a level when the group becomes too big. So the bigger a church becomes, the smaller it has to go. In other words, small groups of people studying the Bible together with common interests and heart, wanting to follow Jesus passionately. Now, of course, this can happen around age or interest. People can get together in the same areas where they live. And these groups can be together for an undefined period of time or maybe for a specific time bracket like 12 months. It doesn't really matter. The point is, as the Orange Leadership Company once said, no one should be able to out-community the church. That's our calling. And I want to say, just a note, is that most of these groups that we form part of in the church, they probably can't tackle the most serious of emotional and personal issues that people face. And so it's the responsibility of each church to connect with specialists in their environment to help and serve those around them. You know, I think of my own life and my wife and I, we have been part of some kind of small group in the church every single season we've had, whether it's postgrad studies and kids and whether we were just dating, whether it's tiredness or excitement and passion, we have been in a group. And the one season that we did not form part of a group like that, I'll never forget standing on the golf course with a friend and just suddenly uttering the words, I feel so lonely at the moment. We have been made for life-giving community. And maybe just one final thought under this idea of fellowship, of community, and that is that Jesus, the evening before his death, he shared a meal with his disciples and he instituted this thing that we call the Lord's Supper or communion. Let me read to you from Luke 22 verse 19. And he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. And we see this pattern constantly repeated in the early church. Again, Acts 2 will show us that the church regularly 
both in homes and in the temple courts, they would share this meal, this Lord's Supper. And the principle was clear. The Lord's Supper is a moment to celebrate the grace that God has so freely poured out over us in this love sacrifice that Jesus came to accomplish, as John 3.16 says. But then lastly, a healthy church will help you discover your calling as you fulfill the mission of Jesus. And in Dr. Day, we call this impacting my world. You see, many people live literally just for themselves. But this is not how we have been designed. God has made us to contribute. And you have to discover the fact that you will find true joy when you are not simply receiving, but giving. Listen to what it says in Acts 20 verse 35. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It's more blessed to give than to receive. True joy comes from this constant flow of both giving and receiving. You have to hear today that you have such a contribution to make. God has made you unique with passions and gifting, with skill. He's given you certain things that make you come alive that other people would not even consider. It would drain them. But as you enter into those giftings, those passions, those strengths, you make such a difference in the lives of others and you take the mission of Jesus forward. You have such a contribution to make. Your life has purpose. Ephesians 4 verse 1 says, Therefore I, a prisoner in the Lord, Paul speaking, I urge you to walk worthy of the calling which you have received. That's for all of us. The word calling simply means the unique invitation that God is making to each of us. It's almost like a coach who calls a certain individual to play a role on their team. And in the same way, God has called every single Jesus follower to take up a unique role in his team, the church. Romans 12 verse 6 says, In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, then serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it's giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have the gift of showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Now I think of chariots of fire. Eric Liddell, this Olympic star, he's, he's gearing up for the 1924 Olympics and he's confronted by his sister who's convinced that he should rather become a missionary to China. But he says to her the following. He says, I believe God made me for a purpose and he has made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. When we function in the gifting and the strengths God has given us, we will experience the joy of God over our lives. Let me just consider this example. Maybe in the church context, you have a passion for the next generation. And then the next question within that passion would be, where are your strengths? Maybe you are a marketer or a teacher. Maybe you are an organizer. Maybe administration is your strength or, or connecting with people on a personal level. The point is, it's, it's when I find that place of unique contribution, of, of giving of myself, that church comes alive. And the Bible teaches that you have been called to fulfill this purpose, this mission of Jesus in every area of life. So firstly, God calls us to fulfill his purposes in our family. Faith starts at home. You have a unique contribution to bring to those who are closest to you. But secondly, God calls us to fulfill his purposes also in our workplace. You have a unique God-given contribution to make to the space you work and the industry that you represent. And thirdly, God calls us to fulfill his purposes in our cities and the areas and organizations that we 
engage with. And maybe now that we know the way of God calling us, maybe the last thing to look at is the what we bring to these spaces. Each of us are called to God's team and Jesus wants us to bring love and faith and hope to our cities and nations. We bring faith to those who are spiritually lost, reaching those who do not yet know Jesus. That was part of his mission. Luke 19, 10 says, Jesus came to seek and save the lost. But secondly, we are called to bring love to those who are experiencing social pain. To bring that kind of healing was part of the mission of Jesus. Luke 4, 18 says that Jesus came to heal the pain of those experiencing that kind of hurt. And thirdly, we bring hope where there is systemic brokenness in society. It's part of the calling of each Christ follower, as Matthew 28 says, to bring the kind of kingdom to bear on this earth that where every person who follows would flourish. You know, if I think about a moment in my life where this idea of community and church and life just came to life, it was a friend of mine, and he picked up a scrap with a guy in another school, and this guy was so angry at him, he literally punched him in front of all of his friends. It was a deeply humiliating moment in his life. And I had the privilege of sitting next to both of them many years later when this other guy, the aggressor, he had come to faith in Jesus. His life was so radically transformed. And the two of them sat in the same small group serving Jesus together. So in closing, when it comes to this kind of devoted relationship that we call the church, Dr. Sadeo loves this word, partner. Listen to what it says in 1 Corinthians 3, 9. We are God's co-workers. In the church, we are co-laborers, co-partners. We are the co-workers of Jesus and His mission on this earth. And so the purpose of our faith is not simply to go to heaven one day. It is to experience God-quality life with others as we pursue the heart and the character and the mission of Jesus today. You know, I have a close group of friends that I've known since high school days, and we've gotten together every single year since we left high school. We call it the Big Five Weekend. It's corny, but it works for us. But I'll never forget one of the early years in this journey, it was work, it was tiredness, it was frustration, and it looked like this weekend was not going to happen. There was a rumbling amongst the people. And I got so frustrated and I had this William Wallace moment of saying to them, guys, we have to make this work. We have to fight for this friendship. And that's exactly what the church is. It's this beautiful family and community that we fight for. It's when you realize that when you fully devote yourself to this family that you benefit so greatly. It's there where you discover who you are. It's there where you go on mission. It's there where you experience family. Daily steps with Jesus means that I belong to my church family. Let's pray together. Jesus, I pray that we would be so stirred for your family, that we would find a place of belonging, of purpose, of healing, and of mission. I pray that every single person that hears my voice would know that you have called them uniquely and placed them specifically. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I, I absolutely love Joe's simple a uh, way of communicating such profound truth. You know what I love more? I love the power of the word in our lives. This habit that the word is challenging us to belong to the body, the family of Jesus Christ, the church. 
I'm reminded of a, a, a Psalm uh, 92 that says, the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a huge oak, a cedar of Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. You know, there's something about connecting your life to the family of Jesus Christ. Uh, over the last few months, we've been considering, you know, doxadale.church and how people perhaps think about their engagement here. This might be, you know, if I can use the analogy of a restaurant, this might be the place where you eat your dessert. You know, you, you're, you're connected into another place, but you come here to eat dessert. Well, let me tell you, whilst that is a great thing, we believe, I believe that there is more. I believe that this online faith community has the power to transform your life to plug you into community and together as we partner together that we would see the transforming presence of God in our community and in your city. And that's why, you know, as Joe is ending with partnership, not dessert ship, um, I, I want to encourage you, if you want to partner with us, if you want to know more about how you can connect to doxadeo.church, uh, don't you want to email us, um, hello at doxadeo.church or just scan the QR code that's on the screen right now. But ultimately, you need to take the next step. You know, we've made it onto your device somehow. I don't know, live through YouTube, maybe Facebook. We've made it onto your device. We've actually made it not just onto your device. We've made it into your life. And now it's your turn to take the next step. So go on, just do it. Um, we want to encourage you to join us um, in a version reading plan. It's a daily reading plan about uh, scripture that connects to this week's word. Uh, again, you can just scan the QR code that's on the screen right now. Um, and you can join us as we read together, um, encouraging daily devotionals and portions of scripture to continue our journey in growing these habits that will transform our lives. Um, community. Um, we have multiple different life groups that you can connect to. One that I want to highlight for you is Mothers That Pray. On Monday, uh, on Mondays, every Monday, there's a group of women that come together that pray for their families and pray for their children. Um, if you want to join that, you can just email us at prayer at oxidale.church, the website, if you want to connect to that. Do remember that your giving is also important as we partner together, not just dessert together, as we partner together. Um, and not just by attending, but also by praying and giving. We amplify the word of God throughout the world in spaces that the local church perhaps would never be able to access. The last thing before we worship together at the end of our celebration today, I want to remind you of our school of the word, Sit, Walk, Stand. This is a journey, a two-week journey through the book of Ephesians. Now, there's no way that we could do a comprehensive study of Ephesians in two weeks. Uh, but Lofty now wants to highlight these three essential ways of seeing your identity in Christ from the book of Ephesians. He's going to do it over two Sundays. And for your convenience, we have two different time slots that you can engage this in. Do remember there's absolutely no cost for you to come and sit under the word. It doesn't cost you a single thing except your time. That's why registration is absolutely necessary. It helps us connect with you and send you all the relevant information to make sure that you're on time and in the right place and in the right Zoom room to be able to join us uh, in this school of the word. Sit, walk, stand, your identity in Christ from the book of Ephesians. Um, it starts next Sunday, so you have to make sure you register today. Um, we've come to the end of our celebration, not our end of time of ministry, because after this, there's gonna be a time of worship again. Uh, but I wanna encourage you, can I pray over us? Um, can I pray over your life? Um, you know, on a personal note, my mom passed away at the beginning of August. It was. Uh, it was a huge shock for us. Um, we're obviously in the United Kingdom. She lived in South Africa. We weren't able to travel. So it went with all the necessary challenges of being able to do that. But can I tell you, uh, being plugged into a household of faith, being plugged into a faith community, these are the moments when these things really deeply make a difference. And so can I, again, just underline the importance of plugging into the household of faith. And here, plugging into doxadale.church becomes an incredible, beautiful way for you to connect your life 
to that which God has destined for you. So let's pray. Father, thank you that I can pray over my life, over our family, over each and every person that is on this um, uh, celebration today. Whether you're watching this live or whether you're watching this um, uh, as a catch up. Lord, I want to pray, Father, where you reveal yourself to them right now in this moment. May there be a sensing in the room that you are present. May there be a sense of tangible experience that you have not left them alone. You have not forgotten. You have not deserted, Lord. You have come into a place of your loving kindness, of your grace that you want to pour out over people's lives. And I want to pray, Lord, as people wrestle and struggle with your word, as we allow your word to impact us, May we bring our lives into a place of surrendering to Jesus. What a beautiful surrender. What a beautiful place to be, Father. And so we, we thank you. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your guidance. Thank you for who you are in our lives. We celebrate that not just individually, but we celebrate you, Lord, as a community of faith in Jesus wonderful name. Amen.
found in you And I'm awakened to the truth But from the start you made me to be like you Yeah, to be like you To know I stand, now I stand